Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, the mouse and the fox. It's one of the biggest media shakeups in recent history as Disney buys up Rupert Murdoch's 21st century fox. But the story goes deeper than that. It's about how we consume all this entertainment content and how our new habit of watching the internet rather than the TV is impacting the corporate landscape. Or is it the other way around? Also this week, why is there no OPEC for gas? Well, there is an industry body, the Gas Exporting Countries Forum. We'll ask its Secretary General what's determining the price of gas. We'll also look at the issue of net neutrality. Who really owns the internet? Who has the right to control our access and why it matters so much? So it is the big media merger. Two names synonymous with on-screen entertainment, and by the sounds of things, this will be no Mickey Mouse outfit. The Walt Disney Company is buying up the entertainment businesses of Rupert Murdoch's 21st Century Fox in a landmark $52.4 billion deal. If it's approved, it'll be a union of Hollywood's heavyweights, but this is also about survival of the fittest. Disney and Fox both need to strengthen their offerings because, as you'll know, we don't just watch the TV or go to the movies anymore. That wider story to come after this from John Hendron. In a move that would reshape the entertainment industry, large parts of what belonged to 21st Century Fox would become the property of Disney. We're getting high quality content, we're getting global reach, we're getting access to new technologies, and we're also getting great talent. That while there's risk associated with this, whether you look at the price or whether you look at the regulatory side or whether you look at the complexity of integrating companies this size, that risk was well worth taking on. The marriage of Fox and the Mouse is priced at $52 billion, but it still needs the approval of antitrust regulators. In an email to Disney employees, Chairman and CEO Bob Iger called it a historic move forward for us, one that reflects a rapidly evolving media landscape. Brands from Rupert Murdoch's Fox empire included in the deal are 20th Century Fox Film and Television, Sky BSB, the National Geographic channels, the FX networks, Star India, and its Hulu streaming service. The aim of this combined company is to create even more high quality content and then to distribute in ways that consumers prefer and consumers demand in today's world. And we think that this combination is going to enable even more of that. Disney expects to save $2 billion in cost savings. Analysts say that will likely come at the expense of shrinking or even eliminating the hallowed 20th Century Fox Studios, the celluloid home to classics such as The Sound of Music. The hills are alive with the sound of music. Here they come. In the very first Star Wars film, with the Hulu service, it will let Disney take on Netflix, Apple, Amazon, Google, and Facebook in the rapidly expanding realm of online video. The massive deal is not a foregone conclusion. The U.S. Justice Department recently said AT&T's bid to acquire Time Warner is unlikely to be approved without major changes. That signals that planned pacts like this could also have to pass intense antitrust scrutiny before they become a reality. Joining us from London now, Mark Mulligan. He's a media and technology analyst and the founder of Media Research. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Disney and 21st Century Fox, um, there's almost not enough superlatives to say how big this deal and this company will be. Well, the interesting thing is it's, it's all about um, your perspective. So in the media world, yes, absolutely huge. But in the tech world... You know, the combined entity is still far off the likes of Facebook and Google uh, and Amazon. And I think that's actually the point. You know, the, Disney and Fox are realising that with the growth that you're seeing within the tech majors versus media companies, the only chance they've got of even being on the same lap of the race as those guys is by being a combined entity. But are they really, I mean, I know they're competing, obviously, in this online world, but they're still, you know, a, a company like Facebook or Google is very different to Disney, which, which has so much history and, and makes the content. Its primary thing is to make the content. Um, we're already seeing Google making its own content. You've got YouTube Red as a starting point, and there will be more. We've got YouTube TV, which is a TV uh, 
proposition which is taking on the mainstream and will, will become a really big deal. We've got Facebook um, making originals. Facebook probably bidding on sports rights uh, next year. Uh, Google potentially bid on sports rights next year. Amazon already looking to bid on sports rights. All of these companies are going to be going right at the home turf of, of, of Disney and Fox. And we've seen with the likes of Netflix and Amazon, you know, th these are companies which have come from nowhere to be absolutely major players, you know, grabbing the Emmys and the awards and the, getting market share and subscribe accounts. What we're in at the moment is a, is a battle between uh, distribution and content. The, the saying always used to be content is king, but now we're seeing that the distribution, the big technology companies, that's where the power resides. And I think we need to look at the Disney Fox deal within that context. Do you reckon they can foot it in this uh, marketplace now, given, as you've just, I mean, you just mentioned Amazon TV and Netflix as one, but there's so many of these streaming services now. Uh, is there a place for Disney within that? We're certainly seeing a degree of maturity in the streaming market, um, in, in the big market. So, you know, in the, the US, we've got more than 100 million video subscribers and, and you know, dozens upon dozens of different services. But there's still vast amounts of growth in this market, you know, even in the US. But, you know, you look elsewhere, so many markets across Europe and the Americas and, and Asia are still really just getting going. So th this is a market which is a huge amount of growth left in it yet. Uh, the challenge is, is if you are a, one company who makes one set of shows, you know, however good those shows are, it's just one set of shows. So if you're going to really have value to your end users, you either need to make sure that's so, so compelling or you need to mix it in with other stuff, which is why when we see the likes of HBO doing its own, um, you know, its own video service, mm. it, it looked so much narrower and shallower than what you'd get on Netflix. Here's the thing though, Mark, everything we've talked about is dependent on having a decent internet connection and we all know how frustrating it is when you don't have one. Um, this is actually a major issue here, isn't it? Making sure that people, if they're going to have access, they've got to have the internet in the first place. Absolutely, and you, you see companies like Netflix have got incredibly smart at this. So one of the things that they're great at is migrating people away actually from mobile viewing to TV-centric viewing. You know, the majority of people who sign up for Netflix on mobile will after a number of months be mainly watching through a TV set. You know, so <clears throat> there's, there's a real recognition from the streaming companies of the need to get people, you know, uh, away from the, the, the less reliable mobile networks into a home Wi-Fi. But there's a much bigger challenge at the moment, which is we're just looking like we're going to have new regulations on net neutrality in the US. And what that essentially means is the telcos that provide the internet access are going to be able to decide which services they want to perform well and which not. Mm. So it might be that, you know, Telco X in the US has launched its own video service and it decides that if anybody who's watching Netflix is going to get a really small amount of connection. So however good your broadband connection is, Netflix is always going to underperform. And that's potentially one of the most worrying developments that's facing streaming services at the moment. And is that just a US issue at the moment or is this something people all over the world should be concerned about? The whole net neutrality debate has been going on for you know, more, well more than a decade, but normally what we see is that when regulations get put in place in the US, then we end up seeing versions of them making their way into legislation across Europe and, 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 and other regions. So uh, it's a very contentious issue. It's one where uh, local governments and, uh, and regulators all have their own viewpoint, but it will be a very important precedent set if the US does go down this route. Final thought for you then, Mark, and this is getting a bit philosophical, but go with me on this, because as we're talking about all this, it just makes me think about this internet saturation. Yes, you made the point that Netflix is trying to drag people towards their televisions, but really, phones, tablet computers, it follows us everywhere. And I wonder about your thoughts on that saturation and what it's doing to us, uh, especially as it's progressing just so fast. Yes, I, we're, it's a really good question. We're in what's termed the attention economy, where all of these different services, are, you know, and social media and you know, everything that we can get on our devices is competing for our attention. You know, everybody's trying to get, uh, you know, a, a bit of our attention to, to get us to spend time with, with their content and services. It's resulted in um, <clears throat> us filling up our time much more than we used to. One of my favourite statistics of the entire digital era is from the National um, Swedish Statistical Office when they were looking at the, uh, the activities most cannibalised by digital media. 
And the number one activity most cannibalized is staring out of the window. <laughs> you know, so we, we, we really are getting to a stage where we're spending less time being mindful, we're spending less time reflecting, we're spending much more time swallowing the information around us. And I think we'll see the most dramatic societal and cultural impact among the Gen Z. That's the, uh, the young millennials born in this millennium or onwards who are tweens and teens. They're the ones who've grown up from the playground with Snapchat, with Instagram. Their entire lives has been this continual feed of information. So I think that's when we're going to see the real impact of what's happened with the, the attention economy bursting at the seams. Mark Mulligan, fascinating talking to you, and I must remember to go and look out the window again. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Now, on that note, it's interesting to hear a former Facebook executive now saying social media is, quote, ripping society apart. Chamath Palihapthia, who headed Facebook's user growth from 2007 to 2011, expressed regret over his part in building the tools that he says are now destroying the social fabric of how society works. He recommended people take a break from social media, saying addiction to it is a global problem. Well, here's the response from Facebook. Quote, Chamath has not been at Facebook for over six years. When Chamath was at Facebook, we were focused on building new social media experiences and growing Facebook around the world. Facebook was a very different company back then. And as we have grown, we have realised our responsibilities have grown too. Now, Mark Mulligan mentioned this next topic in our interview a little bit earlier, net neutrality. And this week, rules protecting open internet access have been repealed by the US government. The changes could mean large corporations can pay the internet service providers to prioritise their websites and even block their competitors. Net neutrality advocates worry this all could lead to censorship and increased internet access costs. Heidi Jo Castro has more on that from Washington. Opposed to the repeal of net neutrality rules in the U.S. and making their voices heard on the streets of Washington, protesters in the end were not loud enough to sway the vote of the Federal Communications Commission. Your card? Aye. Commissioner Rosenworcel? I dissent. The commission voted three to two along partisan lines to undo the Obama-era regulations that the chairman called burdensome and unnecessary. It is not the job of the government to be in the business of picking winners and losers in the internet economy. We should have a level playing field and let consumers decide who prevails. Net neutrality rules essentially prohibited broadband providers in the U.S. from speeding up a consumer's access to some Internet content over others, even if websites were willing to pay for the advantage. The idea was to preserve the Internet as a public resource for all. Protester Randy Collins says the rules had protected her nonprofit's ability to reach an online audience. We sent an email out to a thousand people, and from there grew to 1.3 million around the country and in places around the world. And that was only possible through having a free and open internet that, like, our content and the strength of our ideas could not be blocked or stopped by the size of our budget. Never before has a debate over the intangible connections of the Internet sparked such public passion. More than 20 million comments were received by the FCC prior to Thursday's vote. And now at least two states have said they will appeal the commission's decision. But you've got a court system, you've got Congress people, you've got millions of people who are in your corner and we will achieve Internet new quality. Internet equality, net neutrality, we will win at the end of the day. Internet companies have said they have no immediate plans to change consumers' experience. But now that the net neutrality protection is gone, it remains to be seen how long the industry will put equality over revenue potential. And still to come on Counting the Cost, how households in Greece turned their power bills into checks from the power company, and they did it with more than a little help from the sun. That story still to come. In other news this week, it seems one way to survive retail Armageddon is to engage in some retail therapy. Christophe Cuvillier, the CEO of the European mall owner Unibel Rodamco, has said online shopping has its limits and physical stores will never go out of fashion. 
and he's putting his money where his mouth is. Unibel Rodamco, which has high-end malls from Paris to Helsinki, is bidding $15.7 billion to buy Australia's Westfield. The deal, if approved, will create the world's biggest mall operator. In the US, it was the final policy meeting for Federal Reserve Chief Janet Yellen, and the central bank raised rates by a quarter of a percentage point, while also raising its forecast for US growth in 2018 to 2.5%. That is well above September's estimate of 2.1%. The new Fed chair, Jerome Powell, takes over in February. Also, many are waiting for President Trump's tax bill to pass into legislation, so a lot to watch in the US economy in the next year. And here in the Middle East, Abu Dhabi's state oil firm Adnoc raised $851 million through an initial public offering of a 10% stake in its distribution unit. The listing is part of a strategy by the UAE, as well as other Gulf nations, to privatize energy sector assets. Don't forget the listing of Saudi state-owned oil giant Saudi Aramco, which is slated for 2018. It is likely to be the world's largest IPO. Do you notice there, even in these days of renewable energy, how we generally still talk about oil before anything else? An OPEC meeting or a decision, for example, it is still a big deal and often a consequential one. But now gas-producing countries like Qatar, Russia and Iran have laid out what they think is the future of their industry for the next two decades, and it's looking pretty strong. Remember, natural gas is used for everything from heating to electricity generation, and it's a lot cleaner. I went down to the headquarters of the Gas Exporting Countries Forum here in Doha to catch up with Dr. Mohammed Hossein Adeli, the organization's Secretary General. Okay, thank you. Dr. Adeli, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for joining us today. As I said to you, before we get into the outlook, I do want to deal with the... that. As I said, it's a lazy characterization. Oh, this is the gas OPEC. It's not quite like that. Can you explain for a viewer who's not familiar with the forum how it works and how it differs? Well, our organization is uh, functioning quite differently than, than OPEC because it's a platform to exchange uh, data information and also uh, to foster the coordination amongst the uh, various countries, our mm. member countries, uh, and to uh, have a common understanding of what is happening in the, in the gas market, what are the challenges and opportunities, and how we can address them in harmony. Mm. And this is quite different from just uh, putting quotas on production or quotas on exports. So you don't influence prices as such? Well, or, I, or, in the, or should I say in the same way that OPEC influences oil prices? Yes. Can you elaborate? Actually, uh, uh, here we do uh, support the policies that uh, would secure the uh, supply and a stable supply and demand. Mm. And uh, we do encourage the, uh, the countries uh, to invest and uh, to uh, contribute to the sustainability and stability of the market. Mm. So in that way, we think that we would be contributing to the interest of the member countries mm -hmm. in uh, having a fair price and uh, being able also to uh, have uh, enough revenues for investment. Have you had a desire to get into that realm of, of quotas and, and production numbers and the like? Well, there had, has not been any uh, kind of desire for that because I guess that uh, uh, going through the market mechanism mm. and uh, uh, this level of coordination is uh, working and is going to work in the, in the future. And we have some other organizations and other energy organizations that they are doing the same and they are influencing uh, the, the market variables. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the outlook then. Let's, let's just start with the short term. Well, as uh, you said, uh, uh, last year we had uh, several uh, developments which uh, have affected the long-term uh, trends of energy in general, of course, in gas also in particular. Mm -hmm. One was the uh, US policy, uh, US new administration policy mm -hmm. towards energy and the, towards fossil fuel, which is affected. And, uh, of course, uh, as a result of that, uh, we predict that uh, it is going to be in favor of gas. Right. We have also the new energy package of Europe. Uh, uh, again, that is uh, going to affect this. We have the 13th uh, plan of China. These are all very major developments that is affecting the long-term trend, as well as we have some announcements which are very important. One of them is Qatar announcement. Mm -hmm to increase 30% of its production. Uh, second one is the uh, more progress 
in the uh, development of uh, South Pars gas of, of Iran. Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have uh, some announcement uh, from Egypt that uh, the uh, Zohor uh, field is going to be on, on a stream much sooner than that. Uh, so the, the production, it's in, and Algeria as well, we have some announcement. So all together from the supply side and from the policy side, we have some new developments mm. that is going to affect the, the long-term trend. What is the picture, in the, if I frame it in very basic, of supply and demand? Very good. I, uh, let me uh, just uh, tell you a few figures of the main drivers of this energy and gas. Mm. You know, what is happening is that in the next 23 years, up until 2040, mm. we are going to have 1.7 billion people, more people in the world. In 23 years? In, yes, 23 <laughs> years. We are going to have 770 million more cars. We are going to have 790 million new homes. And the, the people of the world, on average, are going to be 80% more wealthy. Mm. Actually, uh, the GDP per capita on average of the world is going to increase 80%. So altogether, they are, these are very strong drivers for demand of energy. Other renewables, they always look attractive, don't they? Wind energy, solar energy. They, I'm wondering how gas looks and stacks up against them. Well, actually, in comparison with the renewables, of course, renewables do not have any emission and mm. gas has uh, some emission. Mm. But, you know, in general, when we compare them, the efficiency of gas is very high. Mm. The CO2 emission of gas is very low compared to oil and coal. We should not forget uh, that uh, uh, now the dominant energy that is being used by the world is oil, then followed by coal. Mm. So these two uh, are the dominant energies and will remain to be one of the main energies in the, in the, in the whole world. I, I should also say that uh, in the next 23 years, although the uh, share of the fossil fuel is going to diminish and come down, but it is going to be around 75%. So now we are dependent on fossil fuel for 80%. Mm -hmm. And even after 23 years, we are going to be dependent on them on 75%. So this is why gas is very important as we can switch coal with gas mm -hmm. or, s or reduce the other uh, polluting uh, energies with, with gas, we are going to mitigate the uh, CO2 emission. Dr. Adeli, pleasure talking to you today. Thank you Thank so you. much. And finally for you, some good news out of Greece. For so long, it was all about debt and economic hardship. But during that long recession, Greece underwent rapid growth in the use of solar energy. And it means the country will now meet its emissions targets under the Paris Climate Change Accord. John Seropoulos reports now from Lavrio. Greece's solar revolution came from the countryside. 42,000 homes like this one turned their power bills into checks from the power company by selling electricity back to the grid. To pensioner Filipos Argyropoulos, an extra $9,000 a year have made a difference. It's my pension all over again. Without it, we'd be pinching our pennies in this economy. It means I can help my children. My daughter's in school. My son is unemployed. My wife doesn't have a pension. Over five years, households installed 375 megawatts of generating capacity, equivalent to a mid-sized power station. And that's not counting farmers who turned over their land to larger scale production, or industrial installations in solar and wind power, both of which Greece has in abundance. But the government quashed this revolution in 2014. Strapped for cash, it cut the rate at which the grid bought power from homes from 55 cents per kilowatt hour to under 12 cents. The 2014 law effectively removed households from the renewable energy market. Until then, more than 4,000 homes would install solar panels on their rooftops each year. But in that year, the number fell to just 63, and it has never recovered. A new bill now aims to bring the solar revolution to the cities, where more than half the population lives, by encouraging groups of five or more homeowners to install solar panels. But the 2014 rate cut still haunts people like Vula Vandoru, whose proceeds fell by half. 
I'm not sure whether the broken promises of the past make it possible for investors to go forward today. We're talking about an investment of about $70,000. The bill quotes a guaranteed purchase price, but there's also a clause allowing the environment minister to change that price. Can someone trust that after an entire solar economy collapsed because of a law? Greece still depends on fossil fuels for two-thirds of its electricity. That's because its power stations burn imported oil and lignite coal, its only abundant native fuel. But lignite use has halved in the past 10 years, while renewables have doubled to 30% of the electricity supply. If policy is consistent, Greeks have shown they will reach for the sun. And that is our show for this week, but remember you can get in touch with us. You can tweet me at Kamala AJE. Do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do, or drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is the address. You can also head online to aljazeera.com slash CTC, which takes you straight to our page. Individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on there. That is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santamaria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.